Hey, I'm James. Welcome to Game Stories Deep Dive. And in this episode, we are talking about this book right here, Writing the Other, A Practical Approach by Nisi Shaw and Cynthia Ward. This is an excellent book and an important one. It is, to my knowledge, the only kind of fiction writer's craft manual that specifically addresses the issue of how do you represent characters and cultures um, in your fiction when those characters and cultures are different from you. If I'm a white guy who's writing about uh, an African-American guy, how do I do that without being racist? How do I do that without saying things that would be offensive? How do I piece together uh, a representation of a culture that's not mine uh, in ways that are respectful and don't make sort of obvious mistakes in perpetuating certain kinds of negative stereotypes um, or just you know come off as offensive in some other way. This is an important issue, especially when you're world building, you sort of run up against this right away when, because if you're building a big world, a big open space that has multiple cultures in it, then inevitably you start creating cultures that are different from yours. And commonly, when, when authors do that, they will use, consciously or unconsciously, they'll use material um, from our world. They'll take whatever it is they know about cultures in this world that are different from the one they're in, and then sort of subtly put those elements into cultures in their game world that are the sort of other cultures, the outside cultures, outside of where the players come from. Uh, and that can be done well and interestingly, or it can be done in ways that basically just reproduce the same old stereotypes and bigotry uh, but with sort of a fantasy mask over it, right? So we don't we don't want to do that. That's not good. That's not good writing. It's not good game writing, um, and it's also you know problematic for social reasons because um, negative racial stereotypes and negative cultural stereotypes have a real impact on people's lives. And if we are producing media that keeps those stereotypes going, keeps them alive and well. Uh, then we're kind of taking part in the social problem of keeping these stereotypes going, right? So we're going to try to produce games that don't do that, right? Games that represent other cultures, even fa fantasy or you know futuristic sci-fi or alien worlds in ways that don't subtly or not so subtly reproduce um, that same kind of harm, okay? So let's take a look at a couple quotes from these authors. There's a few things we can look at. All right. Um, yeah, that's fine. Okay, so first thing they say, they, they talk about a couple kinds of fallacies or um, mistaken thinking that we can have about, about difference, cultural difference. The first one they talk about is the liberal, what they call the liberal perception fallacy. And they say, this arises when a person, often but not always a liberal, when they decide that because it is bad to judge people, it must therefore also be bad to notice there are any differences between different groups or categories of people or between people who are members of different groups. This is sort of like, I don't know, in the 90s people were talking about being colorblind, meaning they didn't even recognize other people's race. And this is sort of like a well-meaning white liberal attempt to negotiate the difficult uh, topic of racism by ignoring it completely, right? I'm not going to be racist because I'm not going to see race. That's kind of the, the impulse here. Uh, but the way that fails is that it fails to recognize that there really are real differences between groups of people. Um, you know, uh, we, we talk differently. Uh, we look differently. We have different histories, different cultures, uh, different cultural expressions different views of the world and experiences of the world, different kinds of orientations towards politics, different opinions about world events and, you know, what we ought to be doing, what sort of a life philosophy and what we ought to be doing with our lives. Um, those differences are not 
you know, trivial. They're real and they're significant and they kind of determine a lot of how people live their lives. So to just completely overlook those is another kind of racism. To just assume that um, everyone else is just like me is to assume wrongly um, and also to erase important parts of other people's culture and other people's experiences, right? Not everybody's the same. So there are going to be differences and we do need to represent those differences in the worlds we build uh, and, and the stories we write. Flip side of that though, the generalization fallacy. And they say this, the generalization fallacy occurs when you mistake the traits of an individual for the traits of a group. Or when you assign all the traits belonging to most members of a group to an individual who shares that group's primary identifying traits. In other words, if I say, well, I know a guy who owns cats and he's a jerk. So therefore, everyone that owns a cat is also a jerk. That would be the generalization fallacy. I've got, I know one person who's in a group, therefore everybody in that group is just like this person. Or when I have a certain general idea about the differences between my group and someone else's group, uh, and then I apply those differences to everybody I meet that's in that group. So, um, what's a common one? Uh, there's lots of negative stereotypes about uh, Muslims in, in, in the United States and popular culture today. Uh, there's this sort of associations with um, well, all kinds of things, right? Um, and so, so if, um, if I meet someone who's Muslim and I assume about them all of these generalities and stereotypes that I know or have heard about Muslims, then that is also the generalization fallacy, right? Or even if I know something that's like um, not that offensive, if I know that, you know, Muslims read the Quran, a lot of them speak Arabic. And then I meet someone who says they're Muslim and I think, oh, well, you must speak Arabic. Well, no, that's not true because Muslims are from all over the world. They're all different races. They're all different uh, nationalities um, and speak all kinds of different languages. Not all of them speak Arabic. So I'm making the generalization fallacy, right? I'm assuming I know about this group X, Y, and Z. You're part of that group. So all those things must be true about you. And that's not true, right? The reality is not that there, the reality is, is neither of these fallacies, right? There are real differences that we need to respect, but those differences are not simple. They're not easily applied to different groups, right? They're real, but they're not, you can't necessarily assume that what's true about the differences between groups in general is also true about the differences between any two individuals, right? So reality is more complex than that. And they describe it this way. Every person belongs to a large number of categories. All people have traits and abilities that put them into all sorts of categories or groups, groups that overlap, at least some and potentially most other groups, right? So, you know, there's things about being a white American and things about being a, an African American that are really different. And there's things that, you know, have some overlap. We share some things in common. Some of these traits are consistent with one another or with stereotypes attributed to identification with a particular group. Others are diametrically, diametrically opposed to those stereotypes or completely unrelated to the rest of these traits. Meaning you might have some things about you that are, are that do go along with the stereotype that people have of your group. Or you might have some things about you that are completely opposite of that stereotype. The same multi-group cross-group traits should be true of your characters and even of your secondary characters. So this is, this is kind of the key point here, right? Um, everybody, nobody is a perfect replication of all of the traits that go along with whatever stereotype you have of the group, whether it be their religion or their race or their, their sort of physical ability or disability, um, whatever you have cooked up in your mind about the way that people with autism or uh, conservative Christians or um, African Americans or people from Alaska, like whatever group and your ideas about that group, nobody's going to be a perfect match for those ideas, right? Some people will match in some ways and not in other ways, and they will have sort of multifaceted identities. They'll not just be any one thing. 
um, because culture isn't monolithic, it's fluid. Culture isn't like if you are American, then all of these things are true about you. It's if you're an American, then there's a chance that some of these things are true about you. Like that, you know, you're a gun owner because you can own guns in the United States. So people from abroad might look at the United States and think, oh, all those Americans have guns and they shoot each other. You're an American. You must own a gun. Um, but if you're an American who doesn't own a gun like me, then that doesn't quite apply, right? I'm kind of an American who would be in favor of stricter gun regulation. Not to get political, but um, I'm trying to point out that within the context of the United States where gun ownership is legal, uh, not A, not everybody owns a gun, and B, people within that country have different opinions about how that should be, right? Um, and that's true of every single group, every single category. Um, what it means to be white in America or black in America, you're going to find any given person in either of those groups with really different opinions about what that should be and what it's like, right? So when you're creating fictional cultures, when you're world building and you're, have, and you're creating imaginary groups, those groups should be just as rich and complex as the ones that are in this world. They shouldn't be like stereotype, copy paste from our world into your fictional world, right? They should be complicated entities with complicated people in them. You shouldn't have a character that's part of a group where that character is a perfect stereotypical representation of the members of that group and doesn't have any other traits, right? That's, um, that's problematic, right? Because it's reproducing these stereotypes. Okay, they also, a couple other points that, I'll, um, that we'll look at for them and then we'll look at some examples from the games I talked about in the last episode. Um, they say there's unintended and intended associations. So this is tricky because you can, you can have the best intentions and try to faithfully represent cultures other than your own uh, in your story game, your game story, um, and not mean anything bad by it. You can, in fact, be making this effort to be inclusive. And yet, if you don't do your homework uh, or you just you know don't quite know the culture you're talking about well enough then it's very easy to represent them either in a way that's stereotypical or just somehow offensive um, unintentionally and that unintentionally still matters right it's not like you get 100 points for trying to do the right thing but not doing your homework if you're going to represent other cultures and you're going to inevitably represent other cultures in your work when you're world building then you need to be sensitive about that and and find out what kinds of representations of this group have been made in the past um, that were offensive. What kinds of representations have been made about this group that are stereotypical? What kinds of things are authentic about this culture that would be respectful to, to include in my world building, right? So do your homework, don't, don't mess up. And then there's some specific things they point out. They have a chapter called Don't Do This, and there's a bunch of different things. Um, I just pulled a few from here that are relevant. This is the, the stereotype called Dark Horde's Attack. And this is a fantasy trope where um, all the bad guys have dark skin. And they might not be human even. They might be like orcs, but guess what? They're black and they're evil. All right, this goes all the way back as much as I like J.R.R. Tolkien. Uh, in the Fellowship of the Rings, the only place you find people of color are on the bad guy's side. They're those evil black people from the south with elephants, right? So they say, don't do that. They say, if you find yourself casting heroes and villains, whether as individuals or groups, exclusively along lines of color, religion, sexual orientation, or the like, it's time to rethink your approach. So all of the bad guys are black. Rethink that. All of the bad guys are Muslim. Better rethink that. All of the bad guys are gay. Better, <laughs> better rethink that, right? Uh, or the like, which means if of all of the bad guys or all of the heroes are of a certain type, have membership in a certain group, then maybe it's time to think about diversifying uh, your your cast of characters or your cast of cultures. Okay, uh, another one they point out is called subtle victimization which means that's a case when like everyone is beautifully and insightfully characterized but the black characters or 
Muslim characters or fill in the blank are all victims and or minor criminals, right? So everybody is an interesting character and we've included a few minority characters, but guess what? They're, um, they're all basically cheap stereotypes or they're just not very fully realized and uh, they're all either victims of crime without any power or they're criminals themselves. Um, so they're not, they're not well portrayed, right? Don't do that. Last one is called patronizing romanticizations. Romanticizations. Uh, and they say this sort of character arises when the author fetishizes difference to such an extent that nothing is allowed to detract from it or diffuse it. This is sort of like, um, well, fetishizing means sort of to sort of overly sexualize the difference between you and some other group of people. Uh, and it's, you see the difference, but instead of respecting it and accepting it, you like think it's kinky or something. Um, and so you overly emphasize that difference and almost essentialize that difference. The person who's in that group is that group, is that thing, um, instead of being a complex human just like you, right? They say the traits may be seen as admirable or reprehensible, but they're presented to readers in the simplest form possible. So it's like really cheap stereotypes that are present, maybe presented as like desirable, but not really as human. They're kind of objectified, right? Okay, so don't do that either. Those are the three sort of don't do those things for when you're world building. Don't make all the bad guys of a certain group. Don't make all the people of a certain group under-realized as people. And don't take all the characteristics of a certain group and just like fetishize them. Don't make them desirable but objectified, right? They're just people too. Okay, so now let's take a look at a couple games and see like how they do along these lines. I sort of said in a previous video that we would look at, uh, we would come back and look at the masks of Nyarlathotep, which is sort of a vaguely Egyptian name given to, or ancient Egyptian name given to a evil god from outer space, which is already a problem. Um, but let's look a little more closely. If you remember from the last episode of Game Stories, I talked about how cool it is you can travel around the world and you're getting clues and you're going to foreign destinations and stuff and that's neat and I still believe that. Uh, however, let's look more de in more detail at the inciting incident here in New York. Uh, here. When you find your buddy has been murdered, where's the picture of that? That's okay. Um, you go to your buddy's hotel room, he's been murdered and eviscerated. You're going to search that room and get clues that are going to lead you all over the world into all different locations to unravel the mystery of the cult that's releasing pure, unspeakable evil on the world, right? The thing that I did not tell you about that scene is that when the players arrive there, the murderers are still in place, right? Uh, let's see. At the Chelsea, the investigators... Can I highlight individual things? No. Let's zoom in then. Room 410. Let's read this a little bit. At the Chelsea, the investigators get no answer to their knocks. Jackson Elias is inside, but his intestines have been ripped out by three members of the Bloody Tongue. Oof. The killing occurred just moments before. One occultist waits at the door to ambush anyone entering while the others search the room. All are armed with prangas, the preferred weapons of their cult's ritual murders. Two of the killers, two of the killers are Kenyans. But cultist number two is a white New Yorker cocaine fiend of negligible skills. Only he speaks English well. Each wears a shabby suit and a repulsive ceremonial headpiece of the cult. So you're going to kick down this door or open it somehow, and you're going to find that your buddy has been murdered by a couple black people uh, and a cokehead. And you're going to try to, you're going to have this sort of engagement with them, and they're going to run away, and you are going to get their license plate number from their car. And then you're going to follow, you're going to tra trace that down. That's sort of like the, of all the clues that you get, that's kind of the, the most pressing one, right? Who killed our friend and why? Well, it was these couple of black people, and when you trace trace down where they come from, well, they come from Harlem at this place called the Juju House. And in the Juju House, uh, you'll meet Silas and Kwane, 
who sells all kinds of Africana objects and stuff. And if you, he seems like a nice guy, but if you check out his basement, you will find that there's sort of a, a, a room for ritual evil, including African drums, zombies, and some kind of demon in a pit that can be pulled up. And the book Africa's Dark Secrets. So, this is a problem. This is a problem. Uh, and I shouldn't probably have to explain this to you, but I'll, I'll try to just state it plainly. Um, when players first encounter this game, what they find out is that their white friend has been murdered by black people from Harlem who live in the basement of a place called the Juju Shop where they worship evil. I, don't, I shouldn't have to say any more, right? <laughs> that's, that's, that's not a very good portrayal of uh, African culture of African-American culture, of Harlem, right? Uh, and it perpetuates certain stereotypes about African-Americans that they're criminals, that they're violent. Uh, I don't know how many stereotypes there are that they worship evil entities. Um, that's sort of an added twist. But that they're sort of, you know, uh, there's all been all kinds of negative stereotypes that have been presented about Africans and African-Americans by white people over the years, including that they're primitive, um, and that their religions are primitive. And so here we have all of that all wrapped up in one place, right? Evil black people worshiping a weird creature in a pit with zombies, um, playing their drums, and killing our friends. This is, not, this is not how to start a game, right? This is not how to, at least not how to start a game that's going to be culturally sensitive or engage in world building that's respectful of other cultures, right? Uh, if we look back... <clears throat> And Nisi Shaw, they didn't commit this fallacy. They sort of recognized differences, right? Uh, but they did commit this fallacy and failed to produce the kind of complex uh, cultural situation that we would want. Oh, they're black people from Africa and they're evil. Everybody, everybody, there's, this is sort of Dark Horde's attack, right? Kind of stuff. Like, we have bad guys, and guess what? Guess what color they are? Now, this is not going to be true of everybody in, in the adventure. Um, you'll have bad guys from China, too. <laughs> you'll have, also have bad guys that are white um, and, and from the West. But that's not how you're introduced to the, to the game, right? You're introduced with these pretty, pretty lame stereotypes right away. Um, so, as I say, don't do that. Please don't do that. Try to represent your characters in more richly than that. Um, and I guess even that, even this is, situation could be salvageable uh, if these non-player characters were something more than just evil murderers from Harlem, right? Um, if they had some, something, anything else going on that sort of fleshed out who they were as people, um, then maybe you could, you could salvage this. It's, tough, it's a tough go, but, but there's not. There's nothing like that. Okay, did I want to say anything more about this? I don't think so. Oh, 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 yeah, oh, yeah I did, actually. Um, there's sort of GM advice, game master advice, at the beginning of this um, right here. It says, exotic locations are fun. Meaning, you know, we're going to be in Shanghai, and we're going to be in Harlem, and we're going to be in uh, Australia. Those are fun. Play them sympathetically, but broadly and stereotypically. Play them sympathetically, but broadly and stereotypically. I feel like they got half of that sentence right, and the other half just doesn't make any sense at all, right? Um, if you're going to play a culture sympathetically, you should know something about it uh, in more detail than its stereotypes. Uh, so you don't play it broadly. You play it specifically, right? Because you know, you know something about it. Um, to play a situation, and they're talking here about locations should be played broadly than stereotypically, but you can see how it applies to the characters too, right? Broad, stereotypically played um, Kenyans committing mur ritual murders uh, in hotel rooms and in basements in Harlem um, are not, that's not a sympathetic portrayal, right? It's just, it's offensive. And perpetuate stereotypes that don't, that don't need to be around. All right, so let's look. Let's look again. Let's something else. Let's look at uh, Kevin Crawford's Red Tide. 
uh, which I said I would cover too. If you remember, this is a campaign setting where uh, the history of this world is that people running from this evil red mist that's sort of taken over the entire planet uh, have landed in the one safe place left in the world. Uh, this is the deep history of the world and then committed genocide against the local population. They call it the clearing wars. And sort of the history, the section of the history that talks about what well, you can see it happening. They went out and they murdered the Shu, the native inhabitants of the land. Um, S-H-O-U. Later on, and when it's first describing this, we just think, well, wow, they just wiped out First Nations peoples with, like, no remorse. Um, so it, that's, now, that's not automatically a bad thing to have in the history of a game. It's a bad thing in our, in our reality, right? It's, you know, the nature of the United States is that how does the United States exist? Well, it exists because of the North American genocide when First Nations people were, were murdered uh, ruthlessly all across, all across the map. Is it bad to represent that in a game? No, I don't think so, depending on how you do it, right? I would sort of, if this game was sort of seriously pushing the ethical problem of genocide or of later, you know, living in a world where you benefit from that history, if it was pushing that problem, um, I would be kind of impressed, right? It's taking on this complicated part of history, representing it accurately, and asking you to engage with it as players in ways that make you wrestle with, you know, this problem, and then maybe even make you reflect about your own life in different ways. But that's not, that's not how it pans out. The way that it pans out is, oh, well, here, let's look at, when it talks about the people of the Isles, is that where I want to go? No, I guess not. Um, blah, 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 ah. Yeah. Hmm. All right. I thought I was going to pull something up, but I guess I'm not. So the shoe lands are these. This is where the First Nations people in this fantasy world live now because they've been, you know, murdered out of all of this land. Uh, and then you have these different kingdoms of colonists that have conquered this side of the world. And uh, these are basically broken up into different groups of people who more or less represent race stereotypes from our world. Um, like, for example, the Gadal, who are dark-skinned people from the south, or the Ashkanti, who are, you know, uh, either hard-bitten desert clans or fat merchants, right? Uh, or the Iron Garters, who are big, blonde, pale people renowned for piety. Uh, so there's kind of like simple stereotypes of like Nordic people or African people or uh, Middle Eastern people, and they're given different names, and then they're thrown into this world as colonists uh, who live in these separate enclaves on one half of the island. Uh, and then when you sort of are building your hero, we have that? Where are the adventurers? Is the land? Hmm. Maybe I'm not going to find it. When you're building your heroes... No. Man. Bummer. Okay. Um, when you're building your heroes, it, it, it was this part that I wanted to show you that I keep not finding, which was where it said shoe adventurers, that's the First Nations people, are really unlikely. This so game is kind of basically discouraging you from playing that kind of that kind of character. You can be an elf, you can be a dwarf, you can be a gadal or an ashanti or whatever. Um, but you can't be you can be a shoe, but only if you're basically pass as not shoe or or if you're mixed blood somehow and then you'll be ex extremely discriminated against. Uh, and then when you're going to go wandering uh, oh, oh, but so, you know, it also describes the shoe lands as having government and law and traditions, clothing and cuisine. So, the, you know, these are sentient people, but they also show up in like the creature manual. Uh, oh, here it is. A shoe player character is profoundly unlikely in most games unless they manage to completely conceal its blood zone. 
A shoe player character is a profoundly unlikely in most games unless they manage to completely conceal their origins. Half-breeds are much more likely, and these social outcasts often find the adventuring life to be one of their few possible routes to wealth, if not social acceptance. So, the game's basically saying, yeah, you can, pl you can play that if you want, but you, you know, you take on an extra burden that way, if you like. Uh, and then the shoe show up in the bestiary. Other kinds of people do not show up in the bestiary, but the shoe do. And the shoe are not the demons. They're these. Bugbears. Goblins. Hobgoblins. Orcs. And so forth. Uh, and these are the folks that you're going to end up killing. In fact, if you're going to have an adventure in this land, um, odds are where are you going to have it, right? You might wander around in these different dominions, but the real adventure is kind of out here. So you're going to end up going out here uh, and adventuring and fighting and killing the First Nations tribes of orcs and hobgoblins and so forth. This sort of, what's interesting about this is that it brings to light kind of a problem that's behind Dungeons and Dragons and a lot of other fantasy gaming where there's sentient races, like orcs, like goblins, who have intelligence and culture and crafts. And players feel like the game is structured so that we feel no objection at all to just wandering into their villages, burning them all down, and killing everybody and taking their stuff. That's like not even an issue, right? Uh, and in most games, that's just sort of, we just sort of toss that aside as like, well, it's just a game, it's just fantasy. Um, but here, because um, the author has gone into such detail about the backstory and the genocide and the current political tensions, uh, your player characters are going to be participating in that history like actively. They're going to be going out into the frontier in the West and they're going to be murdering First Nations folk and taking their stuff. First Nations folk who are not just monsters. They're given the typical monster classes. Um, so it, it sort of, the game sort of succumbs to that stereotype of like indigenous people as primitive and monstrous in some way. Um, so it's still like giving players a free slate to just go and murder these folks and take their stuff. Uh, but yet we know from reading the manual that they really are intelligent and they really are just as capable of magic and culture and everything else as everybody as as the player characters are so problem right um, i think maybe there's an effort here to create a game where players do reflect on what they're doing and are forced to reflect on uh the kind of harm that they do when they're um, perpetuating this and they're going into these lands and and taking stuff from other cultures but it doesn't seem like that. It doesn't, it's not in the manual. It doesn't sort of say, here's how to get your players to, to, think, to think about what they've done. Or here's some details you can add to make them realize, oh, wait, you know, maybe we should be talking to these folk instead of destroying them all. Um, it doesn't have that. Right? It doesn't have that in it. Um, instead, it's got stereotypes of all kinds uh, sort of mashed together in this, in this weird land. So we can look at Nishi Shaw again really quick. It, it, it definitely doesn't you know, do this. It doesn't sort of say everybody's all the same, but it does do this. It sort of does succumb to cheap stereotypes about this group's like this, that group's like that. Uh, those natives are all evil uh, and weird monstrous creatures. We'll even give them stats so you can attack them. Uh, and it does not do this. It doesn't give sort of rich, complex notions of how people within a group have disagreements and differences and how they um, how the histories of all these groups have led to political situations that have you know ethical problems in them is none of that none of that has shown up instead we have the dark hordes attack cliche uh, and the subtle victimization cliche uh, which is that you know well almost right you still have you have some characterization of the shoe tribes um, but just not to the extent that the others. They're not really playable in the same way that others are. Um, 
And with some of the other stereotypes of the human playable characters, there's a bit of this. There's a bit of fetishizing the differences of the Orient, for example, um, here and there. So a problem. And again, this is not a, not like a, a knock against the author personally or uh, a reason not to check out this game, which is you know brilliantly structured and has lots of cool tables and stuff that you can use separate from it. Uh, it's not an attack to point these things out, right? It's just to say, hey, this is the kind of mistake that people can make when they're designing games. Um, I'm perfectly capable of making this kind of mistake, uh, and I assume you are, to some extent, capable of making this kind of mistake. So let's look at these examples and talk about them so that when we're making our own stuff, we can know kind of what to avoid. If you're going to have bad guys, uh, if all of the black people in the 1920 Lovecraft world are evil, that's a problem. If all of the monsters are portrayed as First Nations people or have that obvious like analogy, that's a problem, right? So think about that. Think about that when you're building a world. It's not to say that you, you have to avoid characters who are black and evil or that you have to avoid characters who are First Nations and victimized. Uh, it's just to say that you gotta be really careful how you do that. And you need to be more complex in your presentations uh, and in your structuring than, than you might do by default, right? So basically the point of this video is check what you're doing, think deeply about it, um, and rethink based on whatever feedback you can get from other people. Uh, I would point you to a couple other resources before I close this video. Um, where are they? A couple of GDC talks that I think are well worth watching. Um, one is called The Current State of uh, Muslim Representation in Video Games. And this is by a panel of people who um, are Muslim and are involved in the games industry in some way or in games criticism in some way. And they just sort of talk about different Muslim characters that have shown up in video games over the last however many years and discuss those representations and and how they work, right? Whether they are good and interesting and engaging or whether they result to stereotypes and um, or whatever, okay? So a great talk and a great example, uh, gives you actually a lot of examples of, of one particular kind, which is if you're representing someone's religion, particularly the Muslim religion, um, what are some things to avoid? What are some things you don't wanna do, right? I would also point you to this talk by Meg Janth uh, 10 Ways to Make Your Game More Diverse. Uh, she's talking to video game industry professionals uh, who want to have a more diverse representation in their video games, and she's saying, well, here's how to do it, here's some mistakes to avoid, here's what you need to think about. Um, another great talk, especially there's a lot, lots of good uh, points you can pull from this as you're thinking about how to structure your own worlds and um, how to collaborate on building worlds that are more respectful and diverse. Okay, that's it for this time. Um, Recommend if you can do it, pick up a copy of Writing the Other, A Practical Approach. There's plenty more um, pieces of wisdom in here that are not, and, and exercises and stuff that I wasn't able to represent in the few quotes I pulled. So, okay, got questions for me? Leave them in the comments or ask them if you're in my class, ask them to me in person or by email. And uh, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.